So, obviously, it's a, it's a very current um, area to be talking about tonight, but what particularly has got you thinking and talking about this and, and really wanting to discuss it in the way that we are tonight? Um, yeah, I, I've just, having come across a number of um, people who, who are grappling with this issue, uh, both in my church, um, but also at work, and realizing that there's a lot of, for me, there's a lot of confusion out there, and certainly for me, just feeling quite confused. What is fact? What is fiction? What is going on in our society? How do we respond as a church? And for us as uh, the, the medics that I work with, how do we respond as medics? You know, how do we do good medicine you know, that's actually good for people rather than harmful? So I think all of those things coming together means that I think it was just something I was really passionate about dealing with. I'm also aware that I've got some experience in it, but there will be a lot of people in this room who have got experience both personally and professionally in this area as well. So um, as, we, as we go on later this evening, uh, please feel free to you know, put your, put your uh, bid in, really, because I don't have a monopoly on, on this topic by far. We're still learning about it, very much so. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to John to um, begin the first part of the evening. And as we've said, please do um, write text as you go. Um, we're really interested to hear what you, what, you know, what's going off in you as we talk this through. John. Thank you. The main thing to say is if you want a copy of this, you can leave your email address or other um, and uh, leave that available. Um, I will be s shooting through some of this quite fast, so feel free just to kind of sit there and you might sort of zone in and zone out at a bit that interests you, that's fine. Or just put your hand up if you want me to slow down or come back to something. But there's quite a lot to get through and I'm aware we're coming from different kind of angles. So some people, some of people here will be very knowledgeable about this. Some of you may feel I don't know the first thing about transgender. So just bear with me. We'll just try and keep everybody up to speed. Um, and uh, yeah, stop me if I'm if I'm going too fast. Um, so Luke, I don't know if I can have the back screen on um, as well. That'd be great. So we're just going to split into two. So we're going to spend a short time just talking about what is transgender so what is what is this thing we're talking about and then we'll have a break for coffee as Chris said and then we'll talk about what might a Christian response be to transgender um, and so I think many of us know when this seemed to first explode onto the scene so Bruce Jenner Olympic winning decathlete came out as Caitlyn Jenner um, and got a world record for the fastest number of Twitter followers. I think got about a million in four hours um, and this uh, this front cover on Vanity Fair call me Caitlyn um, and this was some, something that we're seeing a number of celebrities, a number of endorsements um, for uh, transgender people. We had the Danish girl, again, Oscar winning film um, about this um, Lily Elba who transitioned. Um, and I won't spoil the rest of the story for you, but it's a very, very interesting film. So it's very much in popular, popular culture today. Um, it's not just in the West, it's actually a worldwide phenomenon. So just for example, in Ecuador, this is Diane and uh, Fernando. Um, and they had their first baby last year. Uh, Fernando is a trans man and Diane is a, a, trans, uh, a trans woman. They both had top surgery, so they're able to um, um, spontaneously conceive. And Fernando bore the child and gave birth. Um, and they said, knowing it's our right and there was nothing biological or legal to stop us, we decided, um, we decided to add another member to our family. So this is happening uh, across the world. And then it's also happening uh, in the UK. So look at Facebook. So Facebook tried to keep up with the number of genders coming onto the table. So it was 30, then 51, then 72, I think. And now there's a custom session because actually, you know, Facebook say there were 7 billion people in the world. So there are 7 billion, op billion options for who you are as an individual. So we have a custom, um, a custom area now on Facebook if you're on Facebook. In Brighton, um, on uh, school applications, um, Parents have been asked to kind of rate what their child's preferred gender might be. And in some of their um, reception classes, they've been asked to draw on a line with male at one end and female at the other end, how male or female they feel. And um, just, to, just to mention that in, in the education, there's a, you know, a, lot of, um, a lot of this kind of thing brewing, if you like, a lot of discussions happening about how we teach children and how we acknowledge um, a small number of children who maybe come into school and say, actually, I'm... I was born a boy, but I'm dressing as a girl, and I'm having a girl's name. How do we deal with that? You know, how do we explain those things um, to children? 
Um, it's happening in universities, so this is happening all over the country, gender grammar. So never assume someone's pronoun. So in some universities I'm at, they're encouraging students, um, even if I have known somebody for a long time, like I've known Chris for a long time, um, I mustn't go into a, a new day assuming uh, the gender of that person. So I will say, you know, hello, my name's John, and today I'm using the he, uh, his, him pronouns. And then someone else might say to me, hello, I'm say Chris or, or James, and I'm using a Z, Z or Zers pronoun. So there's different pronouns. Some of them are very neutral, some of them masculine and feminine. So that's coming in as well. I love Monty Python. This used to be a joke. Um, new mother, what is it? Obstetrician. I think it's a bit early to be imposing roles on it now, don't you think? Um, and uh, yeah, so it's becoming, becoming less, less of a joke, I suppose, now, and it's becoming much more of a reality, um, the things that are being discussed. Uh, referral rates are, are soaring in our clinics, as we'll discuss a little bit later. Um, and, and in general, what we're seeing is that there's more in, in the media and the way things are being talked about, there's a, an idea, really, that there's this spectrum and that actually gender exists on a spectrum and that you may, be, you may identify as male, you may identify as female, um, but this idea that there are many people on this spectrum in between, which may actually change um, from one day to the next, depending on, on how you... Uh, on how you are and how you feel. Um, so that's just a little orientation. Um, I'm sure you've got many examples of uh, other things that you see in the, in the media and on adverts and so on of where we see, we see this phenomena happening in our society. I just want to start off with a few terms. I always used to fall asleep at uni with this, getting our terms right. But I think it's really important because um, in our day and age when there's a kind of a cultural war going on, you know, with um, lots of this debate happening around these issues. The first thing that happens is that language is redefined. So a word that may have meant one thing 20, 25 years ago is the, the meaning of it has changed. It's a very, it's a very clever way of um, changing the way people think in society. So it's important that we, we're, we're clear on our terms. So firstly, sex. So I'm going to say it's biological sex. That is male and female. That is, you know, at birth, is it a boy, is it a girl? I still remember that time when my first child was born. We didn't know whether it was going to be a boy or a girl. And it's that moment when you look down and you're looking between the legs and it was like, it's a girl. Um, and that was a great moment um, for me. Um, I'm sure for all of us. Um, although I don't think we remember being born. I don't. Um, but, you know, this, this kind of is evident from anatomy, from chromosomes, from hormones. You know, it's a very clear understanding, scientific understanding of, of sex. Gender, however, is a, is a bit different. So gender is really what we call the psychological, the social, the cultural aspects of being fe 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 female or male. How, you know, how do I express myself as a, as a man uh, or a woman? So gender is that little bit different. So just remember that as we discuss gender. Um, and then gender identity. This is, um, you know, when a child sort of begins to realize that they're a boy or a girl, so my two and three quarters year old, he gets it right now. He can say, you know, I'm a boy, and, which is correct. Um, but, but even a few months ago, you get some variability. So it might be a boy and I'm a girl and just be a bit confused, really. Um, but that's quite normal. And between the age of two and three, a child will develop that kind of sense of I'm a boy um, or I'm a girl. And that's the innermost perception of yourself as female um, or male or for some people, as we'll find, uh, non-binary. Um, just to say, transsexual is a dated term, so we don't use that term anymore, um, and I think that's reasonable, so it would have been a term we used a lot in the past. Um, somebody who said, I feel like I'm born in the wrong body, but we, we're not really using that term anymore, and I won't use it this evening. Um, transvestitism is nothing to do with, with transgender, really. Okay, so this is... Um, Dressing or adopting the persona of the opposite sex, and that's usually done for sexual arousal. It's usually done um, for, for entertainment um, rather than an issue of uh, somebody struggling with their gender identity. Um, and then a, a drag queen, or it might be a drag king, but a drag queen, a biological male who dresses as a female to entertain uh, others. So again, these are not transgender people. Just a couple of distinctions. So many of you, some people may have heard of intersex, and I've heard a number of interviews where people say, "Wow, look at all these children who are born with what we call ambiguous genitalia." So they they're born, and you look at their their genitals, and you can't see whether they're a boy or a girl. And this leads to a lot of head scratching and a, a really difficult time for um, for doctors, usually for pediatric doctors, to decide what do we do? Do we bring this child up as a male or a female? What sort of surgery should we do? 
But just to be really clear again, that is only a tiny proportion of births. I've only seen two in my career. It's very, very rare that it happens. And this is not transgender either. These are, not, uh, these, these are issues with anatomy you know, and, and genitalia, whereas transgender is different. So for, in transgender people, their anatomy is not in doubt. This isn't about whether you've got uncertainty, whether this is a male or a female. But this is the way people experience or live out their gender identity when it's not congruent, when it doesn't match up with their biological sex. So when I say transgender, I want you to think of a big umbrella. This is a, this is a big umbrella term. It encompasses a large number of people. We think about one in 300 people in the UK. Um, so there's umbrella term. It's, it's this mismatch between the way I'm feeling about whether I'm male or female and, the, if you like, my, my sex, my actual external appearance as a male or a female. And then gender dysphoria, if you imagine that big umbrella over this building, gender dysphoria is a small part of transgender. So some people who are transgender will have gender dysphoria, and that is a, a medical diagnosis. There's a significant degree of distress. It has to be going on for six months. Um, and again, it's, it's from this mismatch between who somebody feels that they are and who they perhaps physically uh, they physically are. And these are, these are people who, it's a very, very tiny number, about one in ten one in 20,000, very small number of people who present with significant distress um, and issues with the way that they're feeling. Um, so this quote here just sums it up really. Gender dysphoria and transgender issues are not about having sex itself or being attracted to another sex. This isn't about sexual orientation, like homosexual, heterosexual, and so on. This is about this experiential mismatch. So the, the mismatch in the way that you experience in your brain, your psychology, and your biology. Does that make sense? I move on, because definitions are not the most exciting. Um, and then I finally, just thought, in terms of dis distinctions, is cultural activists. So again, um, just just be really clear, as we speak about transgender issues, we're all coming from different places, okay? And some people uh, here tonight may have someone they know, who's, they walk in their family or close friendship group, who is grappling with this issue, or is, uh, is living in this way. And again, some people here may, may say, I don't know anything about it, John. But I think it's really clear that when we're talking about transgender people, we're gonna be coming at this with a great deal of care um, and uh, yeah, a great deal of compassion and, and, and speaking with people. My, my general response is, if someone walks into a, my church, which is in this, this building, and uh, it's clear that they're a transgender person, my response is the same as it will be for anyone else. Yeah? God loves you. I love you. Um, tell me more about yourself. I mean, that's just our response to everybody, isn't it? It's no different. But cultural activists is a little bit different. So these, these, are, these are people who are using Twitter and Facebook and other things to spread an ideology. Okay? They're going further. They're not struggling with this necessarily themselves, but they want to see widespread change. They want to see society shaken and these traditional structures, these restrictive, often religious structures that bind us to male and female and social roles, if you like, and gender roles. They want us to be freed from all of that nonsense. And uh, that's where we get it. It's a little bit different. So my response to cultural activists who are seeking to often misread science and uh, put out myths and falsehoods, my response is a lot more firm and cutting. So there'll be a mixture this evening, okay? So when it's generally about the cultural activists, you'll find I'm a little bit more cutting. But when it's about people who are actually dealing with these issues, I think our response needs to be very, very measured. I hope that makes, makes sense. Um, so, how have we got here? Um, and I'll, I'll speak about this before we, we break. How, how is it that we've come to Bruce Jenner, you know, nearly two years ago, coming out as Caitlyn Jenner? What is it that's, what's this tipping point? What's happened? I just want to suggest that we've been on a cultural trajectory for a rather a long time. This has not just suddenly come. There's been ground that has been prepared over the last 30, 40 years in particular. And in that fertile ground, um, those envir that environment, then suddenly these things can spring up. And I'm sure transgender isn't the only um, phenomenon we're going to see in the next 10, 20 years. So one uh, kind of cultural maxim is this idea of freeing yourself. You know, be free, throw off. This, this male yoke, perhaps, for feminism. Throw off this idea that there is male and female and that there's marriage and, well, we can do what we want, can't we? You know, Free yourself from these restrictions and uh, enjoy your life. 
or discover yourself. Liberate the authentic inner you. You know, I grew up to the music of M people, search for the hero inside yourself. You know, this is just a classic cultural maxim. You see it on the, I saw it on a bus stop today, you know, the inner you. What's the real you? Find the real you inside yourself. And again, this, um, this quote below, some of you will have read it by now, it sums it up really, and it goes like this. For years, our spirits have been suffocated by restrictive traditions and morality, but now we must have the courage to follow our own light. We must resist anyone or anything that stands in our way. We must discover the hero inside ourselves and enter into the freedom that comes when we become who we really are. And uh, a lot of the root of that, for those of you who kind of like long words, is, is Gnosticism with a G at the front, not an N apparently. Um, but this idea that actually my body, and you know, my body's kind of a secondary thing really. I can do what I want with my body. It's, it's not really worth a lot. It's going to going to melt away, it's going to rust away and uh, be turned into ashes one day and sprinkled into the sea, whatever it is you plan to do. Um, but the real me is the me that's inside. That's the, re that's the real me. Um, and so you can see where I'm going with that and how that sort of will play into uh, issues of transgender. Um, and then we've got define yourself, so you can define who you are. You know, anatomy isn't destiny anymore. We've got very clever surgeons and I've seen the result of their work and it's incredible. All right, it's amazing what surgery can do these days. Very clever indeed. Why be restricted? Because I can be made to look like a, a woman. I'd be a very tall woman, but I could be made to look like a woman with tremendous surgery and use of hormones. Fantastically skilled people we've got doing this. So why should that be a barrier to me expressing who I really am? See where, see where we're going. And then autonomy. The I-world individualism, you just look at the apple, it's intriguing isn't it how Apple use an apple with a bite taken out of it, amazing, think about that. The iPod, the iPad, the iMac, this I-world individualism, me at the centre, this is our highest cultural, yeah, our highest cultural aim really, that I have autonomy. And autonomy, by the way, this is another, sorry I'll get on my soapbox now, but autonomy is a good thing, okay, autonomy is actually a Christian concept that has been hijacked and made something that actually isn't. So autonomy now means goes well beyond um, what it was originally supposed to mean. So anyway, we can talk about that later. Just going to cut it short. It's very interesting, isn't it? And. Um and I appreciate that some aspects of that were quite funny, some of their responses, but I, it's not been shown specifically to ridicule, or just, but it's just to kind of point out that actually on campus, which is where I spend a lot of my time, our, um, you know, our future lawmakers, our future culture reformers, are, you know, these are the issues that are going on and that, that are difficult to answer. And seeing this lady, if you, this, this story, new story broke, Rachel Dolezal, who's a, um, a cultural activist in the States, was outed because she was living as a black woman um, and then she was outed because she wasn't really a black uh, African lady. She was actually a Caucasian lady. And this went all over the press. How dare she you know, try and live as, a, as an African lady when she really isn't? And she's pointed out actually more recently in the last couple of months, you know, why is it that there's one, more, one, more, one rule for one area of society, but another rule for her? Why can she not define who she is? Why can she not say who she is? And the next slide I'm going to show you is, is a bit alarming. So... Um, Look away, and again, I don't show this to uh, ridicule this lady at all, but just to show where this can lead for some people. So even Medusa is um, a lady who is having surgical procedures to make her look more like a dragon. Um, and she believes that she is a dragon. Um, and it's very sad, you see what's uh, happened with her nose and so on. And she's having all this surgery, and again, you apply this kind of, the question, the same principles to this case. Do I show love to this lady by affirming her in her dragonness and so, you know and affirming that that's who she is i'm not sure i'm not sure that that is the loving response to, to just not say anything um, or to affirm her uh, as being a dragon again extreme example but i think we, you know what i'm points i'm making and i think where we've come is we've come full circle where the church used to have the moral high ground you know what, what the church said was moral and right and people listened and that's been completely flipped and as Melanie Phillips uh, said in the Guardian she said at once upon a time binary was a mathematical term 
But now it's an insult, okay? It's not just a description, it's an insult on a par with racist, sexist, or homophobic to be deployed as a weapon in our culture wars. The enemy in this particular battleground is anyone who maintains that there are men and there are women and that the difference between them is fundamental. Things have really shifted. This narrative power in culture is, is really strong. You know, one, I'm doing a talk on this this evening, but we are ingesting all the time the stories um, that we're seeing on, on documentaries and soaps. Everywhere we look, these are the stories that have been woven in, speaking of, of a, the good life, if you like. So that's the cultural trajectory. Politics is, ra- is really trying to catch up, I tell you. Politi- politicians are behind, bless them. Um, the Gender Recognition Act in 2004, um, said that actually you could be re- legally recognised in your new gender. So this is only 13 years ago. A gender recognition certificate is if you're over 18 and you've been living for at least for two years in that acquired gender, you can get a gender recognition certificate. So you're officially now male or female, whichever way. Um, the Marriage Same-Sex Couples Act, just to point out that that meant in the past that if you were married and you changed gender and you got a gender recognition certificate, the marriage would have to be dissolved because it wasn't possible for two males, legal males, to be in a marriage. But of course, with the Same-Sex Couples Act, that is now changed, and with the agreement of the other partner, you can remain in that marriage. And then most recently, and probably most significantly, we've got this House of Commons Women and Equalities Committee report, and in fact, the MP for Luton South sits on this, interestingly. Um, And they have made a number of recommendations Um, which will really, over the next five years, shape policy. And a lot of it's about um, de-gendering government records, so taking gender out of government records, um, allowing you to get a gender recognition certificate if you're 16 or 17, not just over 18, and also reducing the age that some children can get puberty blockers and suppressants. So quite a loosening, if you like, of restrictions. Um, medically, which is the area that I really work in, just so that you're aware, some of you will glaze over this, but the, the definitions, the diagnosis has changed. So in our, in our categorization for mental health problems, we used to have something called gender identity disorder. And this really described anybody who said, I feel that my gender identity, as we discussed, is incongruent, doesn't match with my biological sex, and I'm troubled by that. And you would be given a diagnosis of gender identity disorder. But now that's changed to gender dysphoria. And so that means that you may say that I I have a gender identity issue, if you like, or I don't have the same gender as my biological sex, but I'm not too troubled by it. You know, I'm not distressed by it. It doesn't doesn't cause me that great deal of distress. And therefore, you're not given a diagnosis. And this is, you know, the idea of this was this this is humane because we don't want to diagnose all all, all these people with a mental health disorder. So you can see where that's come from, really good motives there. But there are a number of psychiatrists who are also concerned because we're actually starting to depathologize gender incongruence and say, well, actually, this isn't a mental health issue at all. This isn't a, d- a disorder of the mind. This is a normal part of, of society, a norm- uh, just a normal expression of human, uh, of human nature, if you like. So medicine is kind of very much tied in with the politics and, the c- and culture as well. And uh, just so you're aware, um, I work with a lot of people in prisons and... Um, we're seeing a lot of issues with the way that, we'll be careful what I say, but with um, prescribing for people with gender dysphoria. So in prison there are a very high proportion of people struggling, really struggling with gender dysphoria, um, and there is a lot of pressure to be prescribing hormone treatment for a lot of patients, um, which has led, let me say this in a public setting, has led to a lot of complications uh, and issues. Um, so this is, there are a lot of people involved in medicine who this is hitting really hard um, and they are really struggling with knowing what to do because as we'll come on to a bit later, the evidence isn't particularly there that trying to treat this gender dysphoria particularly improves outcomes or, or mental health outcomes, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, gender identity referrals are going up. They've doubled in the last couple of years. They're kind of doubling and doubling. There are eight clinics in the UK, just one for children. That uh, is in London. Um, what we'll do, I think we'll stop there. Um, the next part is the response. So we're going to talk about how might a Christian respond to the transgender agenda. What is gender dysphoria causes treatment? What does the Bible say about it? Um, how might how might we think about you know how we how we walk with people who may say I'm I'm a transgender person? So that's we're going to get a bit more practical. So vast majority of what I say, you'll be able to say yeah. I, 
you know, I can, understand, I can see that. Um, so don't feel that if you're not a Christian, you're excluded from this at all. So there's four things I'm going to say. Understand the facts, be confident in the Bible, be culturally robust, and be pastorally sensitive. Okay, so that's the four things I'm going to say, um, and then we'll open it for Q&A. So understand the facts, what we know and what we don't. And I think it's really important that I be very honest with you, that I approach, we approach what we know scientifically with a real um, degree of humility, if you like. So it'd be very, it's very tempting for me, if I have a certain view on an issue, to load the slides and load the facts you know, in, in view of my view, for example. So where there isn't evidence to back something up, I'm just going to be honest and say there isn't evidence here. Um, so you'll see that there's not as much evidence as perhaps um, we might think. So the first question is, are males and females different? And that was in the first video that alluded to, you know, what is different about a male and a female? And again, there's just all these, um, there's going to be seven uh, areas, I think, or six, where we, where we actually have really good scientific evidence that males and females are different. That's my simple, really, take-home point on this, is that the scientific evidence that there is a difference between males and females is different is absolutely solid. And I, have, I had a student come up to me just the other week and she said, oh, my consultant, he was a neurosurgeon or something, um, he was telling me how you know, males and females' brains are, you know, there's, there's not a lot of difference, and in fact that you can have a male, male brain and a female body, and he even showed me some images, some MRI images, and I just didn't know what to say. What do I say to that? You know, what does the science say? And again, I give you some references at the end if you want to go and read up. You can read up every single study that's done and draw your own conclusions. But in general, we have really good evidence that in terms of our genetic sex, that's your chromosomes, your hormo hormones, your gonads, that's testes or ovaries, your genitals, and then this idea of brain sex, that actually there is a difference between males and females. A really nice study done four years ago in Israel on the male and the female brains, these are called connectomes, generally showing to a high degree of statistical significance that male brains operate very different to female brains. You're probably not too surprised that a typical female brain, there's more connections going from side to side. And this may account for women's better verbal skills and intuitive abilities, for example. So again, uh, this, yeah, some of these things are quite funny, but I don't want to gender stereotype, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, and I'll go on to that, the, the more complicated issues in just a moment. But in general, in general, male and female brains are very different. And there are some studies which show Potentially that, um, again, we may have had a, a number of studies on transsexual patients. So this is the old terminology, when transsexual patients would die and they would uh, have pre-signed to allow their brains to be studied. And there were some differences uh, noted that actually, if I was a female to male transgender patient, that actually that brain may actually look more male. Um, again, the real difficulty is a lot of these patients are taking hormones for a long time. It's, it's difficult to tell where those changes pre-hormone or were they after the hormones? And that's what a lot of research is, a lot of research is happening at the moment. Um, and then behavioural sex. So um, male or female behaviour. And this is, a, a, having done a lot of work with babies a few years ago, this is fascinating. The take-home point is simple. Children are not blank slates. So Simon Baron Cohen from Cambridge took 24-hour-old babies, as blank slate as you get, yeah? Not contaminated by anything, you know, they're just absolutely blank slates. And they found that at 24 hours of age, boys preferred looking at a mechanical mobile than a picture of a face. And girls respond more, responded more to a sound of a human in distress. At three days, girls maintain eye contact with a silent adult twice as long as the boys. And at seven days, girls could in distinguish an inference cry from other noise, whereas boys couldn't. Real differences noted. This is just one example of many of these type of studies. Children are not blank slates. And again, a wealth of evidence that um, wh when, pe when people say, I mean, Russell Brander said it recently. He said, I've got a four-year-old child and she's a girl, but we're letting her dress as a, you know, whatever she likes until the time when she decides whether she wants to be a girl or a boy. Um, and their view is that if you give completely gender-neutral, you know, gender-neutral toys, you're going to allow your child, you know, just free choice. But the evidence is so strong that actually boys will tend to go and play with a lot of the toys we typically associate with boys, and girls typically will play with a lot of the toys we typically associate with girls. Not the pink and blue thing. Apparently that was flipped just 100 years ago. You know, blue was, blue was very much a girl thing. So it's not so much the colours, um, but the type of play and the way that boys interact with the world. Now, a lot of you will say, if you've got grandchildren, nephews, nieces, and so on, you'll see that in general that's true. It's not the case all the time. 
But in general, if you're looking at science and statistical significance, boys and girls are very different. But what you often get is like a, what we call a bell-shaped curve. So on the left, you've got a female curve, and on the right, you've got the male curve. And this could be for all sorts of things that we typically associate that males and females do different. So let's take running the 100 meters, for example, okay? So we know that men, typically, males will run 100 meters the fastest, and Usain Bolt will be at the far side of, uh, of that right, and someone, um, yeah, so you have a really fast, fast female um, running, running there. So in general, males will run 100 meters faster than the females, but the thing is, there's a huge variability within, within the sexes. So within males, you know, I'm somewhere far, we're near the bottom, you know, for running the 100 meters. Well, you know, I'm way at the bottom. That means that there are many women who run it far faster than I am. You get the picture, okay? So this is, there's this huge overlap. So even though they're very different, we see this overlap. And I think my kind of concern with, um, I think sometimes what we see in society, and you could even say sometimes perhaps what we do in church, is when we overly restrict what it looks like to be a man, we say being a male looks like this. Yeah, this is what boys should do. Um, let's take an example. So somebody that I know who's got a couple of boys and is really keen that they both play rugby. They're from a rugby-playing nation. Uh, and really keen that that's what boys do. And one of his boys is probably going to be a rugby player. He's huge. Um, he runs around, uh, bounces into things. But his other boy, I'm not so sure. And um, if we have overly restrictive you know, ideas of what it is to be male or female, what does it mean for those people who are somewhere in the middle? And for some girls in the past have been described as perhaps... My mum described me as a tomboy. Okay, I've heard that being said by a number of women. Or vice versa for males. I had a, a gentleman in, in Luton say, yeah, well, I, I love poetry. You know, um, and I've, I've always felt that I'm not quite man enough because I like poetry and I don't like running around knocking lumps out of people. And I think my challenge to us tonight is to think, how do we respond to people who are in the middle, in the crossover zone? Because I think if we polarise what it is to be male and female that you can actually end up with what I call the confused middle. And then the confused middle might say, well, actually, I don't really feel, I don't really look like that, that male. You know, I don't really seem to fit that, that, you know, that categorization. And then I'm offered the idea that, oh, ma well, maybe you're not male after all. Perhaps it's because you're, just, just to be very blunt, a female trapped in a male's body. Now, it's a very simplistic way of talking about it, but you get the point. So I think we just need to be aware that Let's be careful with what we, let's not go beyond what the Bible says, which we'll look at later. The Bible isn't actually too prescriptive on gender roles um, in, terms of, in terms of a number of things, dress and so on. So let's just be, be wary of being overly, overly narrow. Gender dysphoria I've mentioned is that, that small category of people who are under that big umbrella of transgender. So again, it's fewer than one in 10,000 males uh, and one in 30,000 females, so a very small number of people. What causes it? What causes these people to have such distress. And I referred um, prisons. I, I've met a few young people um, who have been diagnosed with gender dysphoria. Um, and I'm, I know a lot of medics who deal with people, particularly in prisons, who have got gender dysphoria. And let me tell you, it's a disabling condition. There are people really you know, suicidal and actually committing suicide. And they all say it's because I feel gender dysphoric. What causes it? Again, Debate rages, really. Again, we don't know. Um, it'd be nice to know. A lot of people say, well, the brain sex theory, that's basically I've got a male body, but my brain was feminized in the womb, and I'm actually a female because my brain's female, but the mistake is my body. So if I correct my body, then I'm who I'm really supposed to be. The evidence is not strong um, for that. It's certainly not conclusive. Nurture, how about you know how I'm brought up, um, whether I've got a father figure. Again, the evidence for that is very inconclusive. There's some, some pointers, um, and this quote sums it up, mechanisms are incompletely understood, and research carries on, but genetic, neurodevelopmental, and psychosocial factors probably all contribute. Okay, it's probably a whole lot of things contributing into one, so duck that answer. What is gender dysphoria? What is it really? So is it a normal variant? You know, is it, is it just part of the human, the human condition? Is it... Um, this is what psychiatrists debate. Is it some form of body dysmorphia? So this is a mental disorder, but it's characterized by an obsessive preoccupation that some aspect of your appearance is severely flawed and warrants exceptional measures to hide or fix it. 
And again, I won't pretend that's not a majority view, but there are a number of psychiatrists who say, you know, does, does gender dysphoria sort of fit into that category? Um, or does it fit into a category of, let's say, anorexia nervosa? This is a false belief about one's body leading to radical attempts to change it through dieting. And certainly on my ward, when we get a, usually a young female, but we have had males in as well, and when they say, I feel fat, you know, I'm overweight, um, and I'm not going to eat the food, and you set them a challenge to eat a certain number of calories and so on, and um, if that child says, no, I'm not going to do it, we do not turn around and say, okay, well, that, you know, it's clear that's who you are, and you, you believe that you're, you're really big, as we saw those guys in the video, you might say, well, you know, good for you. Um, you carry on. We don't do that. We don't do that. We feed them. Because we categorize anorexia as a mental health condition. So what is it? I'm still throwing out the, the question and not answering it. Gender dysphoria in children is not uncommon. I get asked this question a lot. You know, what do I do if my five-year-old or six-year-old, seven-year-old turns around and says, actually, I feel like a, you know, I feel like a girl. What do I do when my little boy dresses constantly dresses in, in princess dresses. Does that mean that he is a, you know, he's more likely to be a female? Short answer is, is, is no. Um, gender incongruence, gender confusion, um, certainly amongst some children, is very, very common. So around, well, we think more than 50% will go for at least a stage. It might just be a couple of months where they actually are experimenting a little bit. You know, what's it like to dress in my mum's clothes? That kind of thing. And in terms of, of those who get to the age of 15 and they're still in that sort of zone, only 2 to 30% of those 15-year-olds persist to adult life beyond the age of 21, slightly more for, for girls. 80% of children referred to the Portman Clinic, that's the one place in the UK which deals with children, choose to stay with their birth, birth sex, 80%. And only 20% go on to have hormones or, or later, laterally surgeon, uh, surgery. Um, and then a lot of them um, who do choose are given uh, hormone suppressants. So that can be given at 10 to 13. If it's given in a private clinic, there's no age restriction. I, I believe that the, the age of the youngest child in uh, the States is four, who has had, um, uh, had some initial treatment to start preventing change of puberty. But the idea is that you block puberty so that the child, when they're of age, so when they're 16, under new legislation, they can then decide okay, I would now like to take some female hormones and try and catch up, or I'd like to take male hormones, for example, and transition. So it's about parents making that decision to, to delay puberty. Um, again, I'm just going to just make a suggestion here. Okay, I deal with pediatrics. It's quite radical, really. But um, the idea that of embracing a child's feelings over their biological reality is fraught with risk. Uh, puberty isn't a disease. Blocking it, using hormones... Uh, it can induce disease, um, it will inhibit growth, lead to all sorts of issues with your bone mineral density, fertility. You're, you're kind of rolling the dice. Um, and there is a question mark at the moment. We've got very little evidence. And on one side, people are saying, well, we've got little evidence, so why not try it for these children who want it? You know, isn't that the humane thing to do? And on the other side of the fence, you've got people who are saying, I would side with this, I'll be honest with you. Are children becoming casualties of a big experiment, a societal experiment that we don't know the outcome of? And the evidence so far is that a lot of them may well be harmed. And as a doctor, that puts you in a very difficult position when you're then being asked to deal with children and with adults when the evidence base isn't strong and you're doing things. And even just from a legal perspective, what will happen in five, ten years' time when I've treated a child and they turn around to me and say, you have harmed me through your treatment, which was non-evidence-based, I'm going to sue you. There we go, I throw that in there just for people who worry about that sort of thing. Um, and then even stronger reaction from the American College of Pediatricians. Young children have been permanently sterilized and surgically maimed under the guise of treating a condition that would otherwise resolve in over 80% of them. This is criminal. Okay, strong stuff. I'll move on. The gender basket. This is, the, this is um, what we call the gender basket. Put it all in the gender basket. You know, we've got pa patients, again, particularly in prisons, who have struggled with huge amounts of psychiatric comorbidity, so numbers of diagnoses, lots of mental health problems. And now we have an answer because all of your problems, um, sir, have been down to the fact that you're gender dysphoric. And that is what I'm hearing that quite a lot. Okay, quite a lot. Doctor, you have to give me my... You know, you have to give me my hormones, you have to prescribe them because 
you know, I'm, I need them. And if I, if I don't get them, I'm going to hang myself. Um, and unfortunately, there are, have been cases just this year where that has actually, has actually happened. But there is this huge burden of psychopathology, unfortunately, amongst people diagnosed with gender dysphoria. So it's very rarely a diagnosis in isolation, particularly for adults. There are usually a number of other diagnoses. Again, the debate is, is it because they've been gender dysphoric and we, you know, they've been depressed and um, anxious because of this? And if we treat the gender dysphoria, that they'll then improve? Or is it more complex uh, than that? And just at the moment, we know that there's a ten, between 10 and 18 times higher suicide rate among transgender people than the rest of the population. Can I just pause to let that sink in? I'm not here to, you know, try and entertain us. I'm not here to try and get us angry about something. I'm here to help us to think that there are real people, and I see some of them, um, and I see some of them who are suicidal, and it's dreadfully sad, okay? And this is a really difficult, this is a really difficult area of medicine. It's really difficult for the politicians. What do we do? How do we treat people? How do we help them to have a life where they're not so ill? And 10 to 18 times higher suicide rate, it's just, it's dreadful. How do we respond to that? How does a medical profession respond and the healthcare profession respond? How do we respond to that as a church? Well, it first needs to be with great compassion and concern that this is happening and that things, you know, things need to be done. So I'm glad that there's research going on. I'm glad that there are medics, Christian, non-Christian, who want to help people and do their medicine well and do their pastoral care well, if you like, in church. But that figure at the moment is still the same before and after surgery. We're not seeing, um, we're not seeing great um, changes with, with treatment. And indeed, Paul McHugh... Uh, John Hopkins was the first place to pioneer this surgery, and he said um, that he found that providing surgical alterations to the bodies of unfortunate people was to collaborate with a mental disorder rather than to treat it. And again, his views, which are public, they're in the New Atlantis report, which you can access for free online. It's got all of these summaries in it. Um, and he's now under big fire. Um, behind closed doors, he's under fire. And John Hopkins are being threatened um, with withdrawal of funding if if they don't deal with him and so on. But he's, a, he's the chief psychiatrist, you know, top psychiatrist in the, U, in the US, speaking like that. Um, and the, these treatment options, so either you continue to live in your biological sex, you might choose to cross-dress um, cross intermittently, permanently. You might choose to take hormone treatment, or most extreme, if you like, of all, um, sex reassignment surgery, which is the route that some people take. And that's, uh, as I say, it's from talking therapy to full reassignment. That's the, the, the range of treatment. And again, the most frequent outcome is that people intermittently will engage in cross-dressing behavior. Often it's in private. So there may be people that you work with, that you know, who, you've, who appear to you as John and dresses like a male, but actually when they get home, they're dressing, uh, cross-dressing to alleviate some of those feelings of distress that they feel. Um, they're not doing it for sexual arousals. I went back to my... Um, my opening definition, this is because they are feeling genuinely distressed and they find that cross-dressing alleviates some of those feelings as a coping strategy, but it doesn't resolve things. Um, so that's kind of knowing the facts. I hope that's helpful, just some facts, cause, treatment, and so on. Um, and I just want to say have confidence in the Bible. And we could proof text here. There's a couple of verses in the Old Testament we could go to which talk about um, dressing men, men dressing as women and so on, but I'm not going to do that. And actually, we just want to hear what Jesus had to say about this. The Bible doesn't speak about transgender. It doesn't talk about hormone surgery, okay? Just like with many things, we're looking at scriptural principles. Um, so I think let's just have a little look at Matthew 19. And Deb's just going to come up and read that for us. If you've got a Bible, you can read it. Otherwise, it, the words are on the screen as Deb reads them. So it's Matthew 19, 1 to 12. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went to the region of Judea, to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed, he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any, for any and every reason? Haven't you heard, he replied, that in that... 
At the beginning, the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife, so the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is a situation between a husband and wife, is it better not to marry? Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those who to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are those who who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. So it's a really interesting bit of scripture that um, Jesus has been um, confronted by the Pharisees and they've cornered him a bit. And they're asking him about divorce, and this is uh, his response at the very beginning. And I'll flick back onto it so we can see it. It's, um, it's quite straight, as Jesus often is. Um, and he says, haven't you read or haven't you heard that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? He's almost saying, come on, guys, you know, you're teachers of the law, you know this. This is basic um, kind of primary school stuff. He made them male and female. So this idea that Jesus affirms the idea that the creation order is how God made it to be, that we are embodied, we're sexual beings, we're created male and female, what we call the biblical binary norm. And Jesus affirms that. He never states that there's a, a spectrum. Um, he, he affirmed this binary, this binary norm. But he said that there are exceptions. In verse 12, it's slightly surprising perhaps, but he talks about the eunuchs. And there was some uh, you know, discussion about what, who these eunuchs are? Are they people who are not married? Are they people who have been surgically castrated? There is a difference of opinion. But whatever opinion you take, I think the same principle can come forward. Jesus is saying that there are some who have been born different. Okay? There are some who have been born where it's not clear if they're male or female. And there are some for whom they have been made different. They may have been castrated and their genitalia are, are, are not what they were. And they are now different. They're no longer what might be seen as, as a male in that setting. And there are some who have chosen to become that way. So Jesus is clear that there is a created norm, but for some people it's not straightforward. There are exceptions, whether it's from birth or it's acquired. The overall message of creation is that culture says out there, your psychology is your identity. Let your body be conformed to it. But the Bible says your body is your sexual identity Let your mind be conformed to it. And that's been the traditional way we've seen in a number of different issues, that the reality is something that we conform ourselves to. C.S. Lewis writes a lot about this. But now it's been flipped that actually our bodies, as I say, this Gnostic idea, um, that actually it's uh, what's in our mind is what's real, and we can conform our body to it. The Bible is very different and very affirmative. And in a way, Jesus... You know, he, he really did things that were unusual. A rabbi was expected to get married, therefore to have sex, have children. Jesus didn't do that. He had children sit on his knee. That's not the kind of thing a man did in, you know, in those times. He hung around with women. That was not the kind of thing that a male rabbi did. Jesus turned the apple cart upside down with what it looked like, you know, as, as a man in that society. He challenged the culture. And it's so important that we, we see that the Bible is very clear that there are sex differences. There is a binary. But actually, even Jesus himself challenged the culture, challenged the gender stereotypes, if you like, of his day. And in a way, you could say he became a eunuch for the kingdom of God. He became a eunuch for the kingdom of God, for his purposes. So creation is good. Let's make sure that we, we, are, we rejoice in that if you're a Christian. Don't kind of hold back or be embarrassed about the way God has created us to be. And yet there's the issue of fall. You know, the reality is that we're fallen human beings. We're flawed masterpieces, if you like. We have disordered bodies, disordered minds, and disordered hearts. I stand before you as a disordered human being, as a disordered sexual human being. That is just the reality 
of who we are. And the truth is not always what we feel is true. We may suffer this distance. We may feel something that actually doesn't match to what seems to be the physical reality in our lives. That's called a dissonance, yeah? It can create dysphoria, you know, that, that kind of horrible sense that we're not who we're supposed to be. Would it be, not be a surprise that if we see physical illness and mental health illness, surely it's not surprising if actually in our sexual identity there is brokenness. Is that a surprise to see that in our society or to see that in, in ourselves perhaps, for some of us? It shouldn't be a surprise. Whatever the cause is, whether it's genetic or environmental, we shouldn't be surprised by it. And the Bible says we're sinners, we're affected by sin, it affects us in different ways. Transgender and intersex are therefore to be expected. Full healing may not be possible in this world. Um, and we've got to remember that personal experience of transgender may be very painful and very different. It's individual. I affirm that. It's, we, I don't want us to go out and say, oh, I know about transgender now, I know about this umbrella, so everybody I meet is going to be the same. That's not true. The first thing we do, as we do with everybody, is, you know, hi, what's, what's your name? My name's John. Tell me what it's like to be you. And just listen. That's simple. You know, all of us can do that. We don't have to have ex degrees in transgender, um, all these things. And then redemption. The Bible talks about redemption, that all of creation will be restored. And that actually, becoming more like Christ doesn't mean... Being, you know, being in our, being who we're in our biological sex, or being being matched up now. I don't believe that's what redemption is, but it's, it's this faithful daily struggle with our disorderedness, and knowing the transforming power of the Holy Spirit to change us and to redeem us. And that's good news. And then the really good news of future hope. I love. I look forward to this day when I particularly want to see people who are struggling so much with this issue, but not just this issue. Somebody may be struggling with transgender, but that's not the major issue in their lives. I mustn't let this define them. Um, they are an individual person, and like all of us, we struggle in different ways. But one day, we will stand made whole, dissonance-free, in the fullness of the kingdom of God. And meanwhile, that means we can wait and we can stand together. I can stand alongside somebody struggling in this area. I don't fully understand it. I don't pretend to. But I can say, I too am disordered. I too struggle with dissonance in my life, but one day I will be made whole. Be made whole. That's such good news. This is good news, guys. This is just such good news um, as we approach this really difficult question. I'll just flick through. Be culturally robust. It's really just to reaffirm the culture individual divides. Sex is a fixed biological reality. Traditional gender roles are consistent across cultures. Have you noticed that? They're, they're consistent in terms of traditional roles because they're rooted in biology and not socially constructed. And when a, an otherwise healthy boy believes he's a girl or vice versa, the problem, in my view, and I'm, this is laying my cards on the table, the problem lies in his mind and not in his body. And then once gender identity is divorced from sexual reality, chaos ensues and fantasy rules. I'll let you kind of take those videos you watch their logical conclusions to work that out. Um, and therefore, social pressure on children and teens to self-define too early must be resisted because so many of them are not persisting in that way. We've got to recognize that there can be a lot of experimentation, but let's be wary of affirming self-definition too early on in uh, adolescents whose brains are still rapidly changing, maturing. We think, we think up to 24 is when our brains kind of finish that cortical development. This is something we need to be aware of. Um, and then finally, be pastorally sensitive. So I think, you know, just I want to affirm true gender dysphoria is not a willful choice. It's a distressing condition, not just for the people themselves, but actually often for the wider family. It can be really difficult to grapple with these issues. Again, tell me what it's like to be you. How would you like me to address you? That's the way people will disagree on this, but that's the way that I feel personally, the way that I deal with these, with these things. How, how would you like me to address you? and distinguishing how you are from who you are. I think it's so important to realize that many people are looking for um, identity and community. Well, uh, let's say we're all looking for identity and community. Who am I? And what community do I belong to? And in a culture which is so separated and disparate, where there isn't those kind of community groups, family, nuclear family is not as strong as it used to be, people are looking for identity. Who am I? Who will celebrate me and who I am? And the transgender movement 
There are other movements in similar veins. It's a powerful movement that says we can tell you who you are and we can give you a community which will celebrate you and will, will, will affirm you and give you prominence when perhaps you're somebody who's really struggled in the past. Okay, it's a powerful narrative. Uh, the question for us in a pastoral sense is how do we as a church offer identity, community, and meaning for those who are navigating gender dysphoric lives? We don't need to be scared, but the power of the gospel, we should be confident that actually the church is the ideal place for us all to find those things. So can we provide welcome, acceptance, and community and an opportunity to encounter the transforming power of a relationship with God and the work of the Spirit? My final slide. They often use Pope Francis' quotes, but he has got some good ones. He sums it up well. Jesus would welcome and walk with transgender people even if they undergo sex change operations. And you know, as I read the Gospels, I believe he would. Okay, he's a, he's a God who is drawn near to us in the person of Christ, and he will walk alongside us in our struggles with whatever they are. But, he says, gender theory, this cultural stuff that I've talked about, is a form of indoctrination that should be resisted. Okay, tricky line, isn't it? Pastorally sensitive, culturally robust. That's the challenge for us today. There's some resources which I can send out to you, particularly highlight Vaughan Roberts has done a small book on transgender, Glenn Harrison, A Better Story. And if you really want to go deep, Mark Yarhouse's Understanding Gender Dysphoria gives you a lot of good background. Christians should seek the Bible's viewpoint on such recent cultural issues when so much change has occurred since the scripture itself was relevant. Um, but I haven't got it. But there's two scriptures. There's, there's Deuteronomy 21. I think it's Deuteronomy 15:4 as well, um, which are are talking to the people of Israel. So talking to a uh, you know a people group, um, and the, there's restrictions about uh, males dressing as females, basically. So it's there's something along the lines of it's abominable for a uh, male to to dress in female clothes. Um, there are different interpretations on this. Um, so here we go. Let's read this. Let's just get this right. 21.5. 22.5. A woman must not wear a man's clothing, nor a man wear women's clothing. This kind of thing is an abomination to God, your God. Um, so I deliberately didn't go into them, but thank you. So thank you for picking that up. Um, it's always good to do that. Um, do you think that Christians should fuel, let's say fuel, fuel the Bible's viewpoint on such recent cultural issues? Seek, okay. And when so much change has occurred yeah. since the scripture was written. Yeah. yeah, and I think this comes back to, again, proof texting is really difficult. I think we have, that's why I tried to come back to the overall arching story of creation, fall, redemption, and future hope. And you can approach it from a line of looking at the arc of marriage through that, through that lens. You can approach it through looking at sexual orientation, or as we're talking about today, gender identity. Now, clearly, there are restrictions. Some people were saying, well, that's because the Canaanites, the nearby peoples, that was one of, and there's, there's some evidence that that was one of their, their real things that they did. So men were dressed as women. There would be a lot of temple prostitution. And it really defined who the Canaanites were as a people. And that God's intention for the people of Israel, uh, as it is for the, for the church now, is to be, to be different. He said, I've set you apart. I've set you apart as holy. Therefore, be different um, to those people who are in nations around you, do not be like them, do not intermarry, and so on. So I think the principle of um, being different and being set apart for God is, 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 is unarguable. But I, think there's, I do think there's more than that. I think that um, there is that sense of upholding um, and pointing to the sex that God has given, his people, male or female, and that actually deliberately going against that is not witnessing to the sex that God has given. It's a, and there's a sense of rebellion that I'm going to rebel against what God has given me. And we see that very much in our culture today. I don't think our culture is too different, although in a sense we have moved on, moved on in some ways time-wise. But our culture is very similar, I think, that we, um, that we still try and, if you're anything like me, you still try and shake our fist at God naturally and say, I'm going to do things my way. I don't like being told that anything's going to be imposed on me. 
and I'm going to rebel against it. So I think this is getting, I think it is getting a, a rebellion. Um, and I think, but we see that more strongly in how Jesus teaches about marriage and sex and gender that gives us a New Testament perspective on it as well as an Old Testament perspective. So, okay, I'll do my best with these questions. Cool. I hope you appreciate we, we've deliberately done it this way so that you can be anonymous and ask, you know, the questions that you want to ask. I'll put these two together. Um, why is gender dysphoria more prevalent in pris prisons? And who is it who's exerting pressure in prisons for hormone treatment? Where's it coming from? Yeah, I mean, I think the prevalence of um, psychopathology in prisons is massively higher than the population. If you've ever been involved with prison ministry, you'll be aware, uh, or people who have been in and out of prison, you'll be aware that that population does struggle much more with psychiatric diagnoses, with drug and alcohol issues, with addictions and so on. Um, so I think that's a reason why it's a lot higher. It very, very much gender dysphoria goes, goes with that. Um, as I say, very most of the time is linked strongly to other conditions. Uh, where's the pressure coming from? Um, it is coming from a couple of cases, really, that have, have uh, they haven't really hit the headlines, but they have in the medical world, where doctors are being poured over coals, really, for, for not prescribing on demand. Um, and, uh, I mean, just two weeks ago, um, I had a, somebody that I know was... Um, just describing a fairly typical day in a prison where he's uh, f confronted by a very distressed, we say a very distressed prisoner who said, you know, prescribe me my hormones and prescribe me my diazepam or I'm chopping my willy off. Um, and the problem is, is that a lot of these guys who are making those threats will carry them out. Um, and that puts doctors in a very difficult position, I think. Um, and when you're going to a tribunal where somebody's hung themselves because you, or it seems to be that f three hours before you didn't prescribe what they demanded. Um, the way that the courts are working at the moment, th there is very much a lot of emphasis on, on the side of the patient. Um, and there's not a lot of sympathy in those settings if you're not prescribing. So that's probably the best way I can put it. But um, if, if, you, if, you, if you pray, do uphold our, our doctors who are in prisons, it's a terrible time in prisons for lack of staff and, and stress um, and they took their firefighting and there's a lot of Christians involved in prison medicine but I tell you a lot of them are burning out so please pray for them uh, not just doctors there'll be nurses and therapists um, across the health health sphere I suppose who are involved please pray for our healthcare professionals in that setting and please pray for our prisoners who many of them are, are struggling with multiple multiple issues um, and I would say personally, let's not throw it all in the gender basket because I think a lot of the time it's leading to people being untreated in other areas of their health. If you see gender dysphoria as a mental health disorder, how would you treat it as a doctor? Yeah, it's, such, it's so difficult because um, the treatment for a long time has been counselling, talking therapies, but um, even of those who go into talking therapy, 50% um, drop out. Um, it's not particularly successful, okay? So none of our treatments are particularly successful on the evidence that we've got. Um, so it sounds a bit, bit hopeless. For some people, um, it's clear there are a small number of people who go through surgery and will say they feel cured and they actually are operating on a, on a, a far better level. Um, the number is small. Um, how would I treat somebody? I think the kind of line that I take is that we use the least invasive method possible. Um, I think we could take a really hard line and say, I'm not going to give anybody any hormones which might harm them. I'm not going to do any surgery because I believe that's, I don't know, let's say, for example, against God's will. But when there are people that, who are threatening, threatening suicide and, and there's a treatment which in some people has worked, it puts you in a very difficult position. I'm not somebody who's making those decisions about surgery day in, day out. Uh, in a way, I'm glad I'm not, because I think it's a very difficult place to be. But in general, those who are involved in it um, and who are Christians would say the least invasive method that's possible. Um, but otherwise, we walk alongside and we, we treat to the degree of which we feel that that patient needs treating. And in some cases, that may mean hormones, and in some, it may mean surgery. 
but we don't rush into that. It's very much a last resort. I hope that's helpful. Um, how can you say that the Bible doesn't prescribe the different roles between men and women? It clearly does, the question is. Sure. So I have to just guess what the question is getting at, really. Um, why does the Bible not prescribe gender roles? I think what I'm getting at there is perhaps I overstated my case or, or wasn't clear enough. The Bible prescribes the role of, of male and female. It looks at marriage, and there's very clear prescriptions, uh, particularly in Ephesians 5, in the role of men and women in marriage. Um, and that's absolutely true. But when it comes down to matters of of dress, of play preference in our children, of um, what we define as masculine, what's a masculine gender role, um, what's a masculine gender in, in society. So I'm kind of broadening the term gender role out of the home, as husband, wife, that kind of relationship. I'm broadening it out much more widely and saying, I don't think that the Bible has a, a lot of narrow prescriptions as to what, a, what it looks like to be a male. Um, so I just used uh, maybe some silly examples of rugby and ballet and, and things like that, just to say how perhaps even as, as Christians, just often unconsciously, perhaps in our men's programs or our women's programs, if we're too narrow, we're excluding a large number of people who, who then don't feel that they fit those narrow categories. And I don't think the Bible prescribes those narrow categories. And my example of, of Jesus was maybe a bit controversially that he, he didn't fit the, the, the full stereotype of what a Jewish male would do. Um, I think he challenged that. Um, I'm not saying he went around wearing, wearing women's clothes and was provocative, and, uh, but I think there's a line to be drawn between, you know, your gender, you know, giving, giving glory to God as a Christian, you know, honouring God and honouring the, the biological sex he's given me and not rebelling against that, but also not being overly restrictive so that we confuse others unnecessarily. So I hope that's helpful. Whoever's written that can come back. Please feel free. Um, okay. Um, how do you feel you should deal with those young children, such as the four-year-olds, who go through with surgery but then detransition later in life? Can I say I don't know? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, just to be clear that we haven't we haven't got four year olds going through surgery, so you do need to be an adult to make that decision, um, and it's a long process. Um, I didn't mention it on my slides, but we, we saw a bit of it in Aaron and Katie's story. Um, particularly male to female full transition is very risky, very very risky, um, and there are a lot of risks the other way as well. Um, and I think you know, as in the healthcare profession, we have to be. I do believe we need to be evidence-based and do the best for our patients. And I've got some medics I work with who conscientiously do not prescribe hormone therapy as GPs. The GMC, General Medical Council, are about to change their line on this and they're going to insist that if you're a general practitioner, you have to prescribe hormone-altering uh, drugs. Um, where that puts some of my colleagues, it's very difficult because they have a conscientious objection. And it's, it's not so much based on their faith, it's actually based on, on, this, on the evidence that they feel they're doing more harm than good given the current evidence that we have on, on treatment efficacy. So it, it's in a different role. Detransition is a real thing. Um, so there is a website called um, Transgender Identity Regret dot uh, com it sounds a bit trashy but actually it's a, it's a very well produced website we don't know the numbers who are detransitioning uh, the the response rate to follow up studies is very poor in this population it's less than 50% so more than half of people drop off um, and aren't contactable on follow up now is that because they're living happy lives and they don't want to be involved in research maybe um, or is it because actually they they're, they're very unwell or even worse um, and they're detransitioning, and uh, there's a lot of stories coming through. I don't want to overstate the case, but I'll be honest, there are a lot of people who are talking about detransitioning five, 10, 15 years later. How do we deal with them? How do we, how do we counsel? How do we love people in that position? Um, I think some of the principles that I've outlined have to come first and foremost, that they're a human being. Um, I don't feel there's as many theological issues as some people perhaps might su suspect. You know, am I male, am I female? Because let's say that if your, gen your, your um, genitals have been changed or altered, 
Um, I think I go back to Jesus' teaching. There were some who have been made eunuchs, um, but he's affirming them in their maleness um, a- as men. Um, so I think it doesn't change who we see them as, as children of God, as a Christian, as children of God, and to, to love them, but acknowledge that their life is going to be have a real added degree of complexity. Having transitioned and detransitioned, that means a great, greater degree of complexity and sensitivity, I think, is probably needed. But don't run away from people. If you don't think you've got a degree in transgender studies, please don't run away from people, okay? Because often, as we all do, we just want somebody who's going to accept us for who we are, whatever surgery we've had, um, and we've all got a part to play in that. As a Christian, do you think gender dysphoria has a spiritual aspect to it? Uh, That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think from what I said about the aspects of the fall, I think um, I think it's it, it affects certainly some and not others. I think as with other with other um, conditions and other areas that people struggle with. Um, my conclusion is that I've met so many Christians who struggle with different things. And I wouldn't relate that there's a particular spiritual hold. I'm not sure with the angle of the question, I'm not quite sure, but it might be that is there a certain spiritual hold over certain people? Um, is there sort of certain spiritual warfare going on that's catching up certain people? Two responses. On the one hand, I believe the devil is active and he's looking to, to, you know, to devour people and he's looking to take people uh, down with him. So he, the devil hates people. That's, that's his, his prime... Well, his number one identity, really, as well as being a liar, is, is he hates people. So whatever will cause distress and destruction, he will be involved in. Um, but I don't believe that there's a specific, you know, this is a spiritual curse or spiritual issue for particular people, for things that they've done or things that they're in their family. There's, there's not the evidence to back that up. Um, and I personally don't feel that's a helpful way to approach it. But in general, the answer is yes, the devil is thoroughly involved in every element of the fall um, and he hates people and anything he can do to distract them and destroy them ultimately he will so i hope that's somewhat answered it. Cool. um there was a question about um why the link between mental health and um, gender dysphoria um, and related to that was what do we think about um, conversion therapy that was being used with homosexuals? And is that something that's relevant here or something we should actually completely disregard and reject? Yeah. Wow, well, guys. Um, so what was the first part of that question? I've, I've yeah, link with mental health. Oh, that's really. I think it's just all the studies show that there's a there's a strong link. That if it, and it's it's whether it's causal or not. That that is what studies can't really tell us at the moment. It's very difficult to do randomised control trials on these things, you know, in advance. But retrospectively, so looking back, the vast majority of people, 99% with gender dysphoria, have another um, mental health condition. Um, so it's it's very interlinked. Again, cause or effect, difficult to tell, but they're very linked. Um, conver- deconversion therapy, I mean, it's a very good question. Some of you may have watched the Canadian doctor on the BBC, on the BBC um, programme who's quite controversial and the transgender lobby were really sought to block this BBC programme, which was actually remarkably balanced. Even for the BBC, it was a very balanced programme. But it, they tried to block it, but BBC, good on them, went ahead. And it was a very balanced kind of view on this guy. In Canada, and he's been criticised for seeking with children anyway to who are expressing signs of gender incongruence of actually using effectively conversion therapy to you know, the way that they play with them and the way that they interact with them. Very intensive parental. They get the, the dad to give up if it's a boy. They get the dad to give up his job and spend lots of time with the child and in order to hopefully make show that he's going to be a boy. Um, and he's got he's one of the few people who are doing it or perhaps dare to do it because it's not seen as okay to do that. Um, just like with conversion therapy with homosexuality, if you mention that you're involved in that, you're immediately um, swiped um, by our cultural elite. Um, would I do it? Is there evidence for it? I think it's certainly he would say, and he's, he's a non-Christian guy, 
Sorry, his name's just escaped me for the moment. I'll remember it in a minute. But uh, he's a non-Christian guy, so he's not coming from a faith perspective, but he says that he's got a number of results where he is seeing resolution. Um, we see, do see some results in, um, in adults who, who express a wish to undergo counselling, and a lot of that counselling is aimed at helping them resolve that issue and resolve to their biological sex. But as I said, well over 50% don't even complete the courses of counselling. They drop out, um, and the overall effect of it is actually not particularly positive. So perhaps some of us, we might say we'd love to see that happen, we'd love to see it work and be more effective, but the reality is for some people it is, but for most people it actually isn't. And they actually, most people resolve to live, as I think a number of people who would say I'm same-sex attracted, so if my sexual orientation is different, they actually say I'm resolving to live, acknowledging that I have same-sex attraction, and acknowledging that that may never change until my dying day. But as a Christian, while it is, I'm going to be celibate and I'm going to live a single life to the glory of God, knowing that one day I will be complete and whole again, um, but not vocif vociferously seeking you know, conversion therapy, if you like.